precious Psalm Ed is in the midst of all this trouble, isn't it? He's always there. What a friend. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9 says, Jesus, in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with women and cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death, learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of eternal salvation to all who obey him.
Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22 and 23 says, Through the Lord's mercies, it is through the Lord's mercies we are not consumed, because His compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. His mercy is more. Church, 
It's all eight of us here. And uh, thanks to the eight who are here with the smiling faces. And uh, we're so thankful for that. Now, we talked about the ladies at the tomb. Now, Jesus had appeared to Mary Magdalene. He appeared to these ladies. Uh, and then the Bible tells us later on that he appeared to Peter as well. We know that from this chapter. And then also what Paul says in uh, 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15, that he appeared unto Cephas, who is Peter. And, uh, and so also he appears to two forlorn, sad, confused disciples on the road. We read about that in, in uh, verses uh, 13 to 35. And then he appears to the disciples who were really big on not believing. <clears throat> you know, it's interesting, uh, the argument that people use uh, concerning Christ not rising from the dead according to them. They just say, well, you know, the disciples, they were just so excited. They made this up in their frenzy and their excitement. It was uh, their imagination. They were so excited. But really, if you look at the accounts from all four Gospels, and particularly this Gospel, it says they did not believe. In fact, when the ladies told them about the fact that they had seen the angels and the empty tomb, Quite literally, it means they unbelieved, or they didn't, they had no belief. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? But really, uh, if you look at chapter 24, and you read the whole chapter, you see it begins in what is supposed to be a tragedy on their part, and it turns into triumph. Isn't that a wonderful thing to do? Let I just say this, uh, even in this time that separates us as a church and as individuals, and also is threatening upon a great part of the population. Seems like a tragedy, doesn't it? And yet God can bring good things out of things that don't seem so good. Yeah. And maybe you're here today and you're visiting with us by means of uh, Facebook. Uh, we're glad to have you with us. And maybe you have some questions about, is this really true? Is this whole resurrection thing true? And then how can I have hope well, if you're thinking that, this passage really gives you the strength and courage that you need to believe on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Bible says, and you will be saved. Mm -hmm. Well, let's pray before we look at our passage, shall we? Father, we are so thankful for the opportunity to be here today with our loved ones. Uh, First Baptist Church out there watching by means of electronic device. Father, we sure miss them. We, we long to be with them again. Uh, Lord, it just uh, seems like it's been very long. And uh, yet we look forward to the time when we as a church family can, can be together once again to sing your praises and to encourage one another uh, face to face. And uh, Father, just uh, begin again once again to uh, serve you as we have been serving you. But Lord, even so, uh, help us, each and every one of us, this terrible coronavirus uh, crisis, Lord, to take something good away. Uh, Father, maybe it's to learn something about what we need to change. And perhaps maybe uh, through this time you've comforted us in a way that we've never been comforted. And maybe, Lord, you've brought us together as families, uh, and it's been just a wonderful time. And Lord, we, we just give you thanks. The Bible says that everything give thanks, for this is the will of God. God in Christ Jesus concerning you. And now, Father, as we look at this passage of Scripture, encourage our hearts, Lord, and just bless us as we uh, look into this text. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, before we look into this text, I just wanted to mention to you, we are coming to you live via Facebook, and uh, if the quality doesn't seem as good as it has been, uh, it's Pastor's phone again. We had some technical difficulties with our new cameras. And, but it's Pastor's phone with a microphone on it. So there you go. It might, uh, it might help you a little bit. So just to let you know, and we do apologize to those who have been uh, watching us uh, via uh, uh, the YouTube. But hopefully we'll get that. I appreciate it. Thanks so much working. I'd like to look at verses 13 through 35 of Luke 24. It says this, Now behold, 
two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. And so it was, while they conversed and reasoned, that Jesus himself drew near and went with him. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are so sad? Then said, uh, then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have not known the things which happened there in, those, in these days? And he said to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. So we were hoping that this was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses, and all the prophets he expounded to them, and all the scriptures the things concerning himself, then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he was, would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is far spent. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished out of their sight. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn with us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they arose that very hour and returned to Jerusalem, and found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. We look at these two on the road. <clears throat> Early in the morning, deep morning, the women had gone to the tomb and as we mentioned last week, they hadn't found the body and then Two men appeared to them in flashing, in brilliant apparel. Apparel, and we know that those were angels. And so there, in those passages, we really see the proof of the empty tomb. There was the messenger to say, I'm reminding you what Jesus had said. He's not there, just as he said. And so we see the proof of the empty tomb, but also the proof at what Christ had told them before. On three separate occasions, he told them what was going to happen. In fact, he told the disciples, on the way to Jerusalem, on the way to be crucified, he had told them what was going to happen to him concerning being betrayed, being handed over, being treated spitefully and cruelly, and then crucified, and they forgot. I don't know. You can attribute that to trauma. <laughs> trauma makes us forget things sometimes. It's a terrible thing. Uh, you can uh, attribute that to perhaps uh, just their own unbelief. In fact, it, it says in Mark that as these disciples had gotten together 
at that uh, to eat, and we'll see that later on, that he rebuked them for their unbelief. But here we see they, these two disciples. It was a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem to Emmaus. Seven-mile walk, seven to eight miles. Um, and as they were walking, they, as I look at the text, it's very possible, given their Middle Eastern culture, given their frustration, given all these things, that they were quite animated as they were speaking. We see that in the language employed here. And they were hopeless. It was a fact that all of these things happened, and they were trying to piece them together. Uh, one of these words has the word reason there, has the idea is they were investigating. They were asking each other questions. And then another word uh, suggests in their conversation that, that not only were they investigating and trying to figure out what was happening, but uh, they were probably having an argument. They were exchanging words. And so maybe to anybody who might have been coming by, uh, maybe they were quite a, a spectacle to behold. We don't know for sure. Now, if verses one through about ten were the proof of the as a proof of the empty tomb, here we would have the proof of the holy scriptures as to Jesus' ministry, as to Jesus' suffering and resurrection. Well, I'd like to notice a couple things here. We notice the joy of the empty tomb, the joy that it brought later. Uh, obviously, this joy comes by way of abject terror, right? But joy at the end, amen? By the way, in, by way of application, <laughs> I'm so glad our Lord is in control, aren't you? There are times when we have abject terror. Maybe not like this kind of terror, but we're scared, we're anxious. And, in fact, even in this time of uh, COVID, uh, people are anxious, aren't they? But you know something? God can bring joy out of this as well. Sure. We need to trust Him, don't we? Because He's God. <laughs> Think about this. Rising from the dead? Who'd heard of such a thing? Yes, Lazarus had been risen from the dead by Jesus, but the very fact that the one who raised Lazarus from the dead was now killed in such a shameful way, hopeless. And yet God knew all along, didn't he? In fact, that's why Jesus kind of lovingly scolded them later on. Now, the second thing I'd like to notice is we see this, the, the joy of the revealed Savior. We see the joy of the empty but now we see the, the joy of the revealed Savior. <laughs> Notice, first of all, that we are really hopeless without Him. <laughs> We're hopeless. What kind of hope do we have, even in these times, without our Lord? Where would we be without our Lord? Well, these fellows were kind of hopeless. Verse 13, uh, two of them were traveling that day to a village that was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together. It means they were conversing. They were talking, and the idea here is they were talking the whole way. That's where we get our word homiletics from, if that makes any difference to you. They were discussing these two disciples. Well, they had time to think. They had time on the seven miles to talk it through, to try to make sense out of it all. But they missed out on the memo that Jesus had previously given to the disciples. They, they were listening to the present confusing talk. Their circumstances and their sadness and hopeless desperation were reinforced by others' disbelief as well as their own. Well, the first thing that we see without what they were, they were hopeless. There was hopeless confusion and sadness. They were confused. They were investigating this. In verse number 15, they conversed and they reasoned together. They were discussing this. 
could have the idea of debating, some say. Uh, someone mentioned here that that uh, has the idea of, that it's used in other places, of Pharaoh, uh, I mean, of Pharisees arguing with Jesus, scribes arguing with Jesus' disciples, Jews later on in Acts arguing with Stephen, and uh, Paul arguing, uh, Saul at the time. <laughs> Wow. Well, <clears throat> if they just would have thought, <clears throat> maybe the disciples didn't send on the memo that Jesus had told them about these things. I don't know. Maybe they weren't a part of that original group. What do you think? Well, I think it was perhaps a lot of useless spin. Maybe they were debating about what could happen uh, what was happening with the women and, and, and how, how could they ever see what they saw or didn't see. Maybe they were debating and discussing where Jesus' body was. Maybe there was a discussion uh, was, going, was going to happen about the ones who believed. Why would they believe? Why should we listen to such nonsense? I don't know what it was that they were discussing, but Jesus enters. Now, I like to notice they were confused, but they were also consumed with this. I love the fact, notice what it says here, verse number 15. And uh, so it was while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near. Drew near. The idea here is, is that they were walking along and they were so absorbed in their despair that they didn't even notice Jesus. As they were walking, now if you look in the different Greek texts there of the New American Standard and the, the uh, English Standard Version, that Jesus calls out to them and it says, why are you standing there looking so sad? Maybe he had stopped them and they were standing looking so sad. And, and, but here it says, why are you so sad? Verse number uh, 17, and he said to them, what kind of conversation is this that you have with one another as you walk and are so sad. Well, they were confused. They were consumed with this. They didn't even notice Jesus coming up on them. By the way, here's another little illustration, a little application. You know, even in our darkest time, Jesus is there. <laughs> what a wonderful thought. Now, in this case, he was bodily with them, but because of the fact that he had gone to heaven and he said to all of us, uh, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. He's with us. Even when we don't know. Now, the Bible says when he came up on them, their eyes were restrained. It was literally, they were held back so that they couldn't understand who or couldn't recognize who Jesus was. And we'll talk about that a little later. But here they are. They're, they're consumed. They're confused. They're cast down. It says he, they look so sad. It's interesting that this verse here, Jesus said, what kind of conversation? The idea here is, the word is antibalo, and it has the idea of, why are you trading these words? Why are you why are you hitting each other up with these words? You're exchanging these words. And they were negative words. They were words of hopelessness. This word actually means to throw back and forth like a ball. So you can imagine the conversation they were having. The NET note says that. It has the nuance of arguing or debating. So Christ noticed their frustration. And their, reflect, their, their, their sad hearts were really reflected in their sad faces. They were downcast. They were gloomy. It has, a, it has the idea here of a gloomy appearance. Jesus used this in Matthew 6, 16. Moreover, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance. And so here they were, 
in their hopelessness, their hopeless confusion, and then their hopeless perceptions. Verses 18 and following, notice what it says. Then one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem and have not known the things which have happened there these three days? This is kind of humorous, isn't it? When you think about it, I, and here's the idea. Are you? This is emphasized. Well, who are you? <laughs> who are you? Yeah, someone said this. I like what uh, a, a quote someone said this. The truth be told, Jesus seems to be the only one who really understands what happened in Jerusalem. <laughs> I hope to see this on Heaven's Rerun someday. And you know, can I just say something? We really respect our opinion, don't we? I mean, they thought, even in their frustration and even in all of this, they kind of get on this guy a little bit. Well, who are you? You're the only stranger here. That word stranger means uh, has the idea of a foreigner, somebody who lives... Uh, alongside of, but is not a citizen. And so they, here's the thing. Here's why they were having the problem, and that is this. They did not interpret their situation in light of the Word of God, in light of the promises of God as well. And even in light of what the Old Testament's the Old Testament had said, because that's what Jesus was really going to unfold to them. Didn't connect the dots, if you will, about what the Bible was truly said about Christ's suffering. And so Jesus simply asks, and like this, verse number 19, he says, what things? I don't know about you, but that just makes me chuckle. Now here, is a gracious and kind response. And the Lord allowed them to pour out their opinions, however negative they would be. And they, those words would be used against them. That he would hold them accountable uh, for their words and for their unbelief. You know, it's interesting how gracious God is. How many times have you complained this week? Just about anything. Maybe, have you said, God, where are you? What's going on? How come I can't work? Why am I pent up in my house? Why is this happening, oh Lord? Where are you? You know something? God hears those words. <laughs> he does. And the fact is, you know that he's there, don't you? What a wonderful, gracious God we have. Well, these were hopeless perceptions. Well, I'd like to notice this. Two, third, they were false and low expectations. What do you mean? Well, they're going to tell him. He says, what things? Well, you want to know? Okay, here we go. And we were hoping that this was he who was going to redeem Israel. Besides, indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things have happened. Oh, look, I go up to verse 20. And how, uh, 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 well, actually all the way up to 19. Notice he says, Who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God, and all the people, and how the chief priests and rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. And we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, you want to know why? You know why we're so upset? Well, I'll tell you why we're so upset. It's the third day since these things happened, and yes, and certain women of our company had arrived at the tomb early and it astonished us. How did they astonish us? Well, they were saying that they saw angels and that Jesus' body wasn't there. That is quite astonishing. Wait a minute, aren't you guys supposed to be believers in Jesus? That word astonishing has the idea that you astonish us literally to be outside of one's, to stand outside of oneself, to be beside oneself. 
And so you, you really want to know why we have all these hopes. And then now this, three days and he's gone. And these women with their nonsense. And said he's risen. But we just don't know what to think. Where's the body? Who took him? These women are crazy. Could it be true? I'm not sure. Well, gee, you see why Jesus got them right at the right time. Now here, notice, what, what am I saying? There are low expectations. We were hoping. Well, one commentator I read said <clears throat> that hoping is different than trusting. And notice this in verse uh, number 20. Who was a prophet mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, that is, the, the Jews. Well, great. Jesus, did Jesus prophesy? Yes. He prophesied three times that he was going to suffer and die and go to Jerusalem. He probably he prophesied the end of the world in Matthew chapter 24 and uh, earlier back in Luke. He prophesied. Was he a prophet? Yes. Was he a, a, a mighty prophet like Elijah who called fire out of heaven and did wonderful things? Of course. He caused the blind to see, the deaf to hear, the lame to walk, and he fed 5,000 people and he did all these things and cast out demons. Of course. He did these mighty things and we know he was from God. Ah, yes. But he's not just a prophet. That's not enough. Well, what else? Well, now he was a martyr. He was a prophet who was seized by these chief priests and the rulers of the Jews to be crucified. Our, our leaders didn't accept him. And it was the people who had hoped that he was the Messiah and he could deliver them from Rome. But these, these rulers, these rulers of the temple and named the chief priests and these others, they literally handed him over to these Romans, these cruel barbarians, to crucify him because they rejected him. Well, was that true? Well, certainly. But they didn't realize, too, that Jesus was and is the head of all the nations. And you know what's interesting? how low of an opinion they did have. And it didn't mean that it wasn't high in their mind. But then, but then not only that, he was crucified. This is a shameful, horrible, terrible, cruel way to die. Look, they nailed him. The very idea of crucifixion, there were many ways for people to be crucified. But the, the main idea is that he would be nailed to a, a, a tree of some kind. How horrible and awful. And shameful because in the Old Testament it says he who hangs on a tree is shamed. And so how could the Messiah die in such a way where he would be turning over to these rulers, the ones, and then also this nation to one to, to which we were bound, but yet we were hoping he'd overthrow them. And now <clears throat> these rulers and this nation. They killed him in such a terrible way. And now his body is gone. We're beside ourselves. Oh. So we see here, we're hopeless without him. But you know the wonderful thing is, we can be taught by him, and that's exactly what, what Jesus uh, did with them. Notice verse 25, it says this. It says, then he said to them, oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all, in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded, he, uh, he expounded to them in, in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. Now, this is where the Word was going to open their mind. Jesus would open the Word, which would open their mind. The power of the Scriptures to open our hearts. And that's probably why, why I believe anyway, He withheld their sight. God withheld their sight from them to, to not their sight, but the recognition of Jesus. 
so that Jesus could take the word and let the word of God speak about himself. You know the word has a powerful effect if we just open our minds to it. And the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness unto him, neither, neither can they know them, for they're spiritually deserved. And that's how we all naturally are, until God, through his Holy Spirit, takes that word and opens it up to us in a way that we've never seen before. Well, we see his displeasure with them. You fools. Uh, I don't think he was being contemptuous of them. I think he was just saying, you are ones who are without understanding. Uh, and yet, also, you kind of have a bad heart as well. Someone said this, it, this word describes one with an unwillingness to use one's mental faculties to understand. It's not a lack of intelligence as much as it is mental laziness and carelessness. And someone said that it, it frequently conveys the idea of a wrong attitude of heart, a lack of faith that clouds one's judgment. That's, that describes these guys. You know, from day one, not day one, but from very early on, these uh, little Jewish fellows were brought up in the synagogues. They knew the scriptures. They know. They knew what. They knew what the Bible said. They knew these things. And Jesus is saying, "Hey, you have to consider all of what the scriptures say about me." They were looking for this idea of redemption without a cross. They were looking for a Messiah that that was to redeem the nation of Israel, as they mentioned, and He will, but. They didn't consider the other part about what it said about Jesus. Well, he also calls them fools and slow of heart, slow to set your heart on, slow to believe, revealing his spiritual, their spiritual state. Someone said this means that they were not quick to perceive their Old Testament scriptures had taught the Messiah to suffer, die, and rise. Vance Havner quips, better slow of head to understand than slow of heart to believe. You know, I when I study these two disciples, I find that, I hate to admit this, but I'm a lot like there at times. Are you? How many times when someone comes to you and trying to comfort you, trying to straighten you out spiritually, trying to give you an answer, you give them, yeah, but. Yeah, I know that, but. But what? Well, you don't understand my circumstances. Well, okay. Uh, maybe you have circumstances that uh, I don't understand. But here's what the scriptures say. Yeah, but. You know, in fact, when we're saying that, we're saying, you know what, that's not enough. And you know, it's interesting too, might I add, just on another note, we kind of tend to select scriptures. He says not to believe all of what the prophets have said about me, how it's, in. you know, there are, maybe you're one of them uh, today, you believe what's convenient for you, you see in the scripture that God is a God of love and, and, and mercy and kindness, but you don't understand and realize that God is, a, God is also a God of, of justice and judgment and must punish sin. How many times have we said and talked to people, say, well, my God would never, would never do this, would never put someone in hell. My God would do this. Well, then look, you're, you're honestly, you are not worshiping the God of the Bible then. You must take all into perspective of what God's Word says. And some people dismiss the whole Bible because there are some parts they don't believe. Well, at least that's consistent, perhaps. Read it. Read God's Word and understand what it says. So, I like what he said first. If we notice here, 
there was this rebuke. Sometimes God has to rebuke us. Sometimes God has to pull us aside and say to you, you know what, you got it wrong, straighten up. And that's what Jesus lovingly did. Secondly, bringing to remembrance. Ought not Christ to have suffered and then into and then enter into his glory? The word ought means, was it not necessary? And the answer was, of course. Of course it was necessary. That's what they were missing. For Christ, the Messiah, to enter into his kingdom and to sit upon a throne, he had to die. He died. He had to die. It was necessary for him to do that. And they missed that. Third, recognition. He expounded upon verse number 27. It says, And beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, he expounded to them the scriptures concerning himself. He expounded. The idea has the idea to interpret, to explain. It's used as somebody who interprets a foreign language. I guess maybe to them it might have been a foreign language for the fact that they were not believing on it, like a foreign language. And yet he goes through the whole Bible. Notice what it says here in verse number 25, uh, 26 and 27. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And, then, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. You know that this book is about one thing, and that is about Jesus. From the very beginning to the very end. And so he goes through, and I don't know just where he started. Maybe he started all the way back in Genesis, at Genesis 3.15, when Adam and Eve had sinned. And he pronounces a curse upon them and, the, and, and upon the serpent. And he promises a redeemer who would crush the head of this serpent, even though his heel would be bruised. He would crush, defeat the power of the devil in Genesis 3, 15. Maybe he, dis maybe he discussed the fact with, with them in Exodus that he was, in fact, our Passover lamb, as it is mentioned. Maybe in Leviticus, he's the perfect sacrifice. Maybe in Numbers, and also Exodus, he's that rock that was smote to supply the need. Or maybe in Deuteronomy 18, 5, he was that good prophet, the prophet according after Moses who had come. And maybe in Psalm 16, 22, and 23, the good shepherd, and the one who ended up giving his life for his sheep, Especially we see that in 22. Maybe in Isaiah 52 he mentioned that he would be marred beyond recognition. And of course in verse uh, chapter 53 he would be the rejected, crucified one whom God pleased to crush. And so we took the whole scripture. Now listen, here's an application. First, this thing, this scripture tells us the way to be saved. It's not a man-made. Man couldn't contrive this. In fact, any attempt that man makes to assure one himself of eternal redemption always seems to include himself. Thank you. 